Professor Hogg, Professor of Gurias, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back in this lecture hall. Although this, is, I think, is the first time I've stood here rather than sitting in slightly less comfortable seats uh, where you are sitting back in the 1970s. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, rem I remember uh, th that uh, this wall was here in those days and there were, an incident occurred shortly before I became an undergraduate when uh, the uh, lawyer who became my devil master and uh, his friend uh, uh, dressed up as a pantomime horse and when a lecturer was delivering a rather uh, uninspiring lecture, would appear there, then appear there, and the, the class were laughing their heads off, and the lecturer couldn't understand why uh, his rather dry lecture was generating such humor. I hope there won't be any pantomime uh, horses uh, around tonight, and uh, even if there may not be many laughs, but it, it is an important topic on, on which I uh, uh, address you tonight, and uh, I'm very grateful to Professor um, Avgulias for introducing me to it. The topic is the potential and perils of financial technology. Can the law adapt to cope? To, to cope? And I begin with a quotation. Money is fine, Aaron, but data is power. That's a fictional quotation, but it contains an important truth. The playwright James Graham put the words, or words to that effect, into the mouth of Dominic Cummings in a fictional conversation with Aaron Banks, the businessman who funded UKIP and the Leave campaign uh, in the Brexit referendum. Data is power, and so is artificial intelligence. And the theme of my talk this evening is whether, and if so how, law and regulation can cope with the challenges, the use of data and, uh, and AI uh, by the financial community uh, are posing to us. There are four technological developments which have created the new opportunities and challenges. They are first, the huge increase in computational and data processing power of IT systems. Secondly, data have become available on an unprecedented scale. Thirdly, the costs associated with the storage of data have fallen. And fourthly, increasingly sophisticated software services have come onto the market. There are various definitions for artificial intelligence, or AI as I shall uh, refer to it, which focus on the ability to perform tasks that otherwise would require human intelligence. Jacob Turner, in his recent book on regulating AI called Robot Rules, speaks of AI as, and I quote, the ability of a non-natural entity to make choices by an evaluative process. That is so. But AI is not confined to matching human intelligence in the performance of its tasks. Machines can beat grandmasters at chess and outperform expert players of Go. I would prefer to define AI as computer systems able to perform tasks which traditionally have required human intelligence or tasks whose completion is beyond human intelligence. Within AI, there is machine learning which involves the designing of a sequence of actions to solve a problem known as algorithms, which optimize automatically through experience with, and with limited or no human intervention. This ability poses significant challenges to our law, as I will seek to show. There is also the process known as big data analytics. Computers can now find patterns in large amounts of data and from many and diverse sources and our data is readily available. In 2016, 68% of adults in, 11, in the 11 most economically advanced countries owned a smartphone, giving access to the internet and machine learning. That is a great empowerment, but it has its downside. As Jacob Turner stated, every time we use a search engine, the search engine is using us. It raises major questions about our privacy 
and about the manipulation of decision making via the use of targeted advertising and other pernicious uses of the social media, uh, such as uh, recent concerns about uh, the, the misuse uh, of the media by uh, Google, or mis the misuse of Google and Facebook have shown. There are many benefits in the new innovations, and in particular the new processing capacity and storage uh, infrastructure. In the written version of this talk, I list uh, a number of those, and uh, it will be available on a website afterwards. There are also less benign uses to which big data analytics and AI can be put. They can be used as a means of social control by authoritarian regimes in ways which pose serious challenges to Western concepts of human rights. In China, the government is developing a social credit system using big data analysis technology to assess the economic and social reputation of its citizens and businesses with the aim of promoting trust. But it is a very wide-reaching mechanism. As a result, it can involve the blacklisting of debtors who don't implement court judgments, but it can also penalize mere social behavior, which the algorithm deems as not conducive to the promotion of trust or good citizenship. The scoring extends to the mining of people's data on websites to get a full profile of their behavior, including their friends, their health, the newspapers they read, their shopping history, and their social exchanges. The system awards credits for approved behavior and negative credits for behavior that is frowned upon. People with low credit scores can be registered in, on a public blacklist and excluded from high-speed trains or banned from domestic flights. And there are reports of people being refused access to hotels, to private schools, and excluded from uh, prestigious work. In Western society, governments have not sought to impose uh, such control, but there are concerns about the potential, use, uh, uh, potential for abuse of big data, for example, in relation to health insurance or to credit. And there is widespread concern about the misuse of data by the tech giants that I've mentioned and others. Concerns ab about the uh, foreign intervention in our democratic process have grown. Well, I know it's a statement uh, by the prosecution. The grand jury's indictment in the United States against Internet Research Agency, LLC, dated 16th February 2018, which is the product of the inquiry by the special counsel, Robert Mueller, is a sobering read, giving an account of the employment of hundreds of individuals and the expenditure of millions of dollars on online operations the creation of fictitious persons as opinion formers, and the carrying on of a misinformation operation on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to spread distrust of presidential candidates and the political system in the leading to the 2016 US presidential election. The speed of technological development poses a real challenge to the law and to regulation. The business consultancy McKinsey have estimated that, compared with the Industrial Revolution, the changes being affected by AI are happening 10 times faster and at 300 times the scale, thus having roughly 3,000 times the impact. The McKinsey Global Institute highlights the increasing pace of technological change and quotes an estimate from an industry insider that humankind will generate more data in the next five years than it has created in the last 5,000 years. So it's necessary to ask, how can the law cope? My topic today is not so much about those wider concerns which I present simply as uh, a context of, the, uh, of uh, AI and uh, machine learning. Instead, I'm looking more to the question of the use of AI, big data, and other financial technology by financial firms. Many of the concerns about the wider use of, of these uh, technologies are replicated in the world of fintech. I will examine some of the benefits and potential benefits of fintech before looking at blockchain technology, AI and machine learning, and data protection. And then I'll seek to set out some ideas on the need to reform the law of contract to address smart contracts and 
potentially, contracts created between machines. The attribution of responsibility in Delix, or tort, for harm caused by semi-autonomous semi or autonomous machines and the developments of new concepts in property law. Finally, I will ask how this is to be done and make some observations concerning regulatory initiatives. The power of AI and machine learning to analyze data should be able to contribute to a more efficient financial system in those economies who em which embrace fintech. Lenders will have more information to assess the credit quality of borrowers and to make decisions on whether and how much to lend quickly. Insurers will be uh, better able uh, to uh, assess risk and market their insurance contracts more efficiently. Customers of financial institutions increasingly rarely visit their bank branch but obtain money from ATMs or if they have patience to do so to solve problems by speaking to chatbots. Banks are thus able to provide their services with many fewer staff and branches. Banks are using AI and machine learning to maximize profits from scarce capital, to improve their models of, for risk management and stress testing, and to carry out market impact analysis by creating so-called trading robots, which evaluate the impact of the business's own trading on the market in which it operates. Asset managers and trading firms can use machine learning to devise trading and investment strategies and in portfolio management to predict price movements. Advocates of fintech assert that consumers and investors should benefit from lower fees and borrowing costs if the new technology reduces the costs of those services. The technology also has the potential to make financial services available to consumers who are currently excluded from or have only limited access to those services, for example, because they have a limited or no credit profile. Access to reasonably priced credit can do much to alleviate profit poverty, both at home and internationally. I turn then to develop, uh, uh, distributed ledger, te ledger technology. The development of algorithms has enabled the collaborative creation of digital distributed ledgers by which a database of assets is shared across a network of sites, geographies and institutions and in which all participants have their own identical copy of the ledger. The European Securities Markets Authority has described distributed ledger technology, DLT, systems as records of electronic transactions which are maintained by a shared or distributed network of participants known as nodes, thereby forming a distributed validation system that make extensive use of cryptography, that is computer-based encryption techniques such as public keys and private keys and hash functions, which are used to store assets and validate transactions on distributed ledgers. This technology, as the, the, those, of, uh, those of you who have been taught by Professor Avgulias will be very aware, originated in blockchain, uh, which a person or persons under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto developed uh, in about 2008 to create the peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency Bitcoin. In his paper on Bitcoin, Nakamoto emphasized the uh, attraction of a decentralized payment system by which electronic cash could be sent from one party to another without going through a financial institution or other trusted intermediary and which would make the payments irreversible or at least impractical to reverse, thus removing the need for a merchant to trust his customer to pay for his goods or services. This content concept has undoubtedly appealed to anti-establishment libertarians, but Bitcoin has not been without its problems. As a permissionless system, it is open to the public and members of the public can affect and verify changes uh, to the ledger, but the method of maintaining the validity of the record on the ledger is extravagant in its energy use. The proof-of-work validation method used by Bitcoin involves the use of very large quantities of computing power as people mine, mining inverted commas, to obtain further bitcoins. 
It's been estimated that Bitcoin already uses as much electricity per year as the annual consumption of the Republic of Ireland, and uh, that by 2020 it will consume as much as Denmark. Bitcoin has also proved to be the object of speculative bubbles. It has suffered crashes in value in 2011, 2013, and 2014, and particularly, of course, in 2017, when the coin rose from $1,000 to over $19,000 before falling back sharply. When I gave a lecture on fintech in Shanghai this October, uh, last year, last October, the price of a Bitcoin was about $6,400. When writing this lecture at the end of last month, the price was about $3,800. This price, you might think, would be disappointing to someone who bought in when Bitcoin fetched in the teens of thousands of dollars. Other concerns about the cryptocurrency have included the pseudonymous nature of the participants in its transactions. It appears to be attractive to criminals who wish to launder money and concerns have been expressed about its use in tax evasion, drug trafficking and the funding of terrorism. Europol estimates that between three and four billion pounds is laundered using crypto assets every year in Europe. Now, that is a small proportion of the money laundering industry in Europe. Um, but a recent report by the Financial Action Task Force to the G20 states that suspicious transaction reporting linked to crypto assets is rising. Digital currencies have also been used by the controllers of ransomware, the malicious software used to prevent users from accessing their computer system until a ransom is paid. While there may not have been breaches of the DLT ledger supporting the cryptocurrency, there have been major problems with the software at Bitcoin exchanges in, in, at which the digital currency is exchanged for fiat currency. Thus, the Tokyo-based Bitcoin exchange, which ha had handled 70% of the world's Bitcoin trades, had to be closed down in 2014 after, uh, threats, uh, uh, of, uh, after thefts of over $450 million worth of Bitcoin were discovered. And in August 2016, 72 million, worth, uh, million dollars worth of Bitcoin were stolen in a hack of the Bitfinex exchange. In the first 10 months of 2018, uh, uh, um, 927 million dollars uh, was stolen from coin exchanges uh, by hacking, uh, including 500 million uh, fr uh, from a hack on the, on the CoinCheck uh, exchange. More recently, it has been reported that the sudden death of the 30-year-old founder of Quadriga uh, CX, Gerald Cotton, has left up to $190 million uh, of cryptocurrency beyond the reach of their owners uh, as they were stored offline in cold wallets on his encrypted laptop, and no one knows how to get access to them. The extent of fraud and serious misrepresentation in initial coin offerings, ICOs, uh, has done much to discredit this means of unregulated funding. The Financial Conduct Authority has spoken of market volatility and the lack of transparency and oversight, heightening the risk of market manipulation and insider dealing on exchanges and trading platforms. And there are proposals uh, currently at consultation to extend the regulatory reach of the FCA to bring in further types of crypto assets and to apply anti-money laundering regulations to them. I doubt whether the future lies with permissionless cryptocurrencies with decentralized validation. But I expect that, 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 that there remains a bright future for distributed ledger, uh, ledger technology and probably also for digital currencies which are developed and possibly underwritten by major uh, mainstream financial institutions and central banks. Several central banks are exploring the introduction of DLT-based digital currencies issued by a central bank and backed by a fiat currency. And large 
international banks are examining the introduction of digital currencies uh, backed by their reserves of fiat currency. In February this year, JP Morgan announced that they had created and successfully tested a digital coin representing a fiat currency using blockchain-based uh, technology. JP Morgan see the digital coin as a means of achieving instantaneous transfers of value, reducing their clients' counterparty and settlement risk, and decreasing uh, requirements to hold capital. They are currently seeking regulatory approval. Distributed ledger technology offers many benefits. You can trace the ownership of assets on a blockchain. You can, if a trusted institution controls the ability to alter the blockchain, DLT can provide an accurate record of prior transactions without incurring uh, great expense on validation. DLT has the potential to reduce the costs of banking transactions and international trade by eliminating the need for the transmission and handling of paper documents and simplifying cross-border payments. The, uh, the FCA reports that there have been cases uh, in the regulatory sandbox, which I'll address shortly, which have demonstrated on a small scale that exchange tokens have made payment services such as international money remittance cheaper and faster. There is the potential to speed up and reduce the costs of uh, transactions uh, by reducing and even eliminating uh, uh, intermediaries in financial transactions. And the World Bank quotes an estimate that the financial sector alone could achieve savings in the range of 15 to 20 billion dollars per year. An important part of the savings uh, may result from the use of smart contracts which are contracts whose terms are recorded in computer language and which are automatically executed by the computing system. At its simplest, a smart contract involves an instruction to the computer that if X happens, then the computer is to act to make Y the result. In other words, the smart contract is performed automatically without human intervention. This removes, or reduces at least, the risk of default uh, and avoids the cost of enforcement of contractual obligations. If you agree to transact by computer using smart contracts, you get automatic performance. It's like putting money into a vending machine to buy a bottle of water. The computer's if-then logic operates. Money in, bottle out. The reduced dependence on intermediaries, such as central counterparties, uh, and the reduced uh, risk of default, which blockchain technology can offer, are seen, uh, seen as a means uh, of improving uh, financial market infrastructure. In, in a recent paper uh, stemming from this university, Professor of Gullias and Professor Kayas argue that the use of DLT systems in securities and derivatives trading, clearing and settlement, has the potential to transform the structure of the financial services industry. The dependence on and concentration of power in the hands of a few CCPs in derivatives trading is seen as giving rise to systemic risk and also creating moral hazard because a CCP may be too big to fail. In the securities transactions, the costs of the use of inter investment intermediaries who hold securities as depositories and the risks associated with the rehypothecation -hypoth of securities which have uh, been received as collateral in one uh, transaction, as collateral in a second transaction, are seen as problems. The authors suggest that DLT systems uh, can reduce that dependence. Uh, and uh, on intermediaries give the ultimate investor more control over the securities which it owns and increase transparency and traceability. The new technology can reduce costs and, as the authors suggest, create greater transparency and liquidity for long-term finance by creating markets for previously illiquid investments. There is considerable international interest in the potential of DLT technology. Security exchanges in Canada and Australia have declared their intention to move to blockchain-operated trading and clearing, and the South Korean capital markets regulator advocates collaboration in developing an integrated blockchain system for stock transactions. 
The Bank of England has been studying how real-time gross settlement service uh, could be adapted uh, to support settlement in systems using DLT technology. And a consortium of Hong Kong and Singapore banks have started using DLT technology for processing trade finance documentation following a successful trial which suggested that there were savings in both time and cost from the use of the technology. AI and the ability to process rapidly so much more data than was possible in the past should assist institutions to make better evidence-based decisions. Sophisticated investors and commercial organizations may be able to benefit greatly from what technology can offer, including in the area of peer-to-peer -peer lending. But there are important risks which ought not to be underestimated. The availability of big data and the ability of computers to process and analyze the data in, waves, in ways which were previously not possible give rise to unprecedented ethical and regulatory questions. Since at least 2008, the ethical standards and responsibility of financial institutions have been the subject of adverse public debate. More recently, Similar questions are being asked of the, the, the principal providers of technology, such as Facebook and Google. In short, can financiers and big tech be trusted with the power which the information revolution gives them? The concerns uh, have been expressed about the potential of, for data to be used in unacceptable ways. Big data threatens privacy. The increased capacity to combine and process data from various sources has made it easier to identify individuals who are data subjects. Re-identification technology may undermine the current views uh, of what is personal data. Algorithms could be used to restrict certain, persons, certain people's access to finance or insurance on unlawfully discriminated grounds and they can be used as a means of social control. The misuse or loss of data stored in the cloud will be a concern if financial services are provided in that way. Cybersecurity is a challenge for, while financial institutions constantly build their defenses, cyber criminals develop ever more sophisticated means of attack. There may be a need to protect retail consumers from risky products by limiting access to certain platforms only to sophisticated investors. This may be the case with platform lending, as currently platform providers do not owe any form of fiduciary duty to lenders in crowdfunding should things go wrong. And things did go wrong in many ways in China, where these platforms first claimed a substantial market share forcing a government to crack down. But uh, there may also be problems for financial institutions themselves. 55% of the trades in the U United States equity markets and 40% of such trades on European markets are automated with all key decisions being made by algorithmic programs. The Financial Stability Board, the FSB, has warned of the danger of herding in financial markets. This is the process by which traders adopt similar machine learning strategies and so amplify financial shocks. The FSB has also warned about the danger that insiders and cyber criminals may be able to manipulate market prices by identifying predictable patterns in the behavior of the automated trading strategies. Another concern which has been identified is the risk that financial markets may become too dependent on a limited number of technology suppliers so that the insolvency of or other disruption to the business of the big supplier could itself disrupt the market. The development of fintech also poses a challenge to the legal systems of the United Kingdom and not just our systems. In the UK we have long taken pride uh, in having legal systems which promote commercial activity and which can be adapted to cope to changing circumstances. Lord Gough, in an extrajudicial writing, spoke of judges being there to give effect to the transactions of business people and not to frustrate them. 
We, he said, and I quote, are there to oil the wheels of commerce, not to put a spanner in the works or even grit in the oil. Oiling the wheels of commerce when businesses are developing novel means of transacting through the use of AI and machine learning uh, poses a serious challenge to lawyers, judges, and legislators. Much of the literature on the challenges posed by AI and machine learning has focused on robotics, including the development of weapons and driverless cars. Perhaps the principal concern is the attribution of responsibility for the acts and omissions of robots. Only last week, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales announced the establishment of an advisory body uh, to offer guidance to the senior judiciary on AI and its impact, including its effect on the law. I hope that that body's work will extend to fintech or will, will result in the creation of a body to examine the use of technology in financial practice. I turn then to the law itself. Because of the importance of contract law in, in financial transactions, I will begin with that. Both English law and Scots law should, without much difficulty, uh, should, should not have much difficulty with questions about parties' intention to enter into contracts and the interpretations of, uh, interpretation of contracts because of the objective approach we adopt uh, in that context. So long as the operation of the computer program can be explained to judges who, like me, may be, or in my case, are, is, am, am, deficient in our knowledge of computer science, uh, it should be relatively straightforward to conclude that people who agree to use a program with smart contracts in their transactions have objectively agreed to the consequences of the operation of the if-then logic of the program. In the context of financial transactions, the English law requirement for consideration shouldn't be a serious difficulty, and if necessary, uh, while I argue against the existent, continued existence of this doctrine, the flexible law of estoppel in England should uh, ride to the rescue. The self-executing smart contract cannot be unscrambled in the same way as a traditional contract because it's not possible to annul it and halt its performance in the course of execution. The smart contract's strength in eliminating default by causing X to bring about Y prevents the courts from stopping the performance of the contract. Rescission in that sense is not an option for the contracting party. This means that the remedies for say, fraud or misrepresentation inducing the contract are to order the retransfer of the property which has passed under the contract. This could be achieved by a, de a declarator or south of the border declaration that the contract uh, was induced by fraud or other misrepresentation combined with an order for the retransfer uh, and developing the law of unjustified enrichment or again south of the border unjust enrichment uh, to reverse the effect of a contract which uh, has not yet has not I shouldn't say not yet has not been rescinded much greater problems in the law of contract may arise if computers are developed to use machine learning to optimize the transactions which they enter into. If businesses were to use computers with machine learning capability to deal with other computers with similar ability, they could autonomously generate transactions which would not fit easily into our contract law. Uh, could one party to the contract turn to the other and say, as, Dido, as Aeneas said to Dido, non hic in federa veni, or that wasn't the deal I entered into. Or should the law say that those who willingly use computers with machine learning to affect their transactions are to be taken as intending to be contractually bound by whatever deals these machines make? If a financial institution could walk away from a machine-created transaction, that might create chaos in the commercial world. If there is to be a contract drafted or adapted by machines, there will have to be significant development uh, in our law of contract, which will require careful and imaginative consideration. 
Now, it may sound rather fanciful that commercial organizations would allow computers autonomously to devise and enter into contracts with each other, but it may not be beyond the realm of possibility since there are commercial advantages in allowing computers to optimize trading deals and there is always the risk of unintended consequences. There springs to mind the public relations catastrophe of Microsoft's chatbot called Tay, which was meant to be programmed like an inoffensive teenage girl. Tay had to be decommissioned within 24 hours as various computer programmers discovered how to game the, ch game the chatbot's algorithms to cause it to send offensive messages containing conspiracy theories and racist, neo-Nazi and sexualized content. It seems to me uh, in this context that there is great merit in the concept of the regulatory sandbox, which I will discuss as a means of testing innovative fintech in a relatively safe environment. It's sufficient to say at this stage that if fintech is developed to use machine learning to optimize contractual contractions, there is a need for our commercial law to develop, to develop new concepts to address that phenomenon. Questions about the intention to enter into legal relations, to whom that attention, intention is to be attributed, and how the terms of a computer-generated contract are to be recorded to achieve legal validity and interpreted will all require innovative thinking. I turn then from contract to delict or south of the border tort. The law of delict or tort will need to be revised to attribute liability for harm caused by machines exercising AI. Taking the most common form of delict, the law of negligence, how does one develop concepts akin to the neighborhood principle of Donahue and Stevenson, Donahue against Stevenson, and the carefully tra crafted rules by which judges have developed the common law to place boundaries on the involuntary obligations which the law imposes? Sadly, it's not just a matter of the reasonable bot on the San Francisco tramcar replacing the reasonable man on the Clapham omnibus. These are legal abstractions. Alpian's classical legal precepts to live honorably, to injure no one, and to give everyone his due can provide a basis for the regulation and self-regulation of human activity. In the law of negligence, reasonable foresight and proximity, the neighborhood principle, have fixed the boundaries of involuntary obligation in many concepts, in contexts. But how do you impose liability and give compensation for the failure of a machine to comply with Alpian's precepts, to injure no one and to give everyone his due? And when one addresses economic delicts, namely the intentional infliction of harm by unlawful means or inducing breach of contract or conspiracy, which require a mental element uh, of an intention to cause harm, or the delict of fraud in which knowledge, the knowledge or belief of the misrepresentor is relevant, how do you impose liability uh, for the harm caused by the autonomous acts of computers? Where financial institutions choose to use AI in transactions with each other, the participants in the, such transactions can regulate their relationship, including the responsibilities for the outcomes of the use of AI, by contract. But when harm is caused to persons who are not parties to the contractual relationship, we enter the field of involuntary obligation, uh, that is delict oblique tort, or liability imposed by statute, or unjustified enrichment. Questions of the attribution of liability are arising in relation to driverless cars. There, there the principal concern is to have remedies for personal injury or damage to property caused by the vehicle. Part one of the Automated and Electric Vehicles Act 2018 imposes liability for third party personal injury or property damage caused by an automated vehicle driving itself on the road or other public place on the insurer of the vehicle or if it's uninsured on the owner. Similar 
but more difficult questions will arise in relation to the attribution of liability and causation in the context of transactions performed by fintech. Is liability for harm caused by the decisions of the machine to be imposed on the producer of the machine on the product liability model? Or should the owner or organization which operates the machine be answerable for such harm? More fundamentally, in a market system in which it is entirely legal to impose economic harm on a competitor if one trades within the boundaries of the law, how do you define what is an economic wrong resulting from the autonomous acts of machines? Having identified what is an economic wrong, wrong in such circumstances, should the law impose strict liability for the harm caused by the acts of the machine? Or should liability be imposed on the natural or non-natural person producing, owning or operating the machine only if a natural person could reasonably have foreseen the risk of harm? These are fundamentally important questions of legal policy and the common law does not currently provide any ready-made answers. To my mind, a no-fault compensation scheme funded by levy or taxation such as is available in New Zealand to compensate personal injury is a non-starter because of the potential scale of economic loss compared with the compensation paid under such schemes for personal injuries. There seems to me to be scope for a regime of compulsory third-party insurance which, like that of the driverless car, uh, could be on a no-fault basis. But there is a problem as to the amount of insurance cover uh, which would sensibly be required. In the UK, compulsory third-party motor insurance in respect of property damage has been fixed at the comparatively modest level of £1.2 million. The potential scale of liability for economic loss from financial transactions is on a quite different level from liability for personal injury or physical damage to property. What would be a prudent or economically manageable level of compulsory insurance for FinTech B? And how many insurers will be prepared to offer such cover in the absence of product standardization and a legal certification process? These questions can be answered, but they need to be addressed. Turning then to property law, there is also a need to adapt the law of property to cope with the assets which are the products of fintech. The Financial Conduct Authority does not view exchange tokens such as Bitcoin, Ether or Litecoin as money. When used as a means of exchange within digital communities, their volatility, which I've discussed already, militates against their use as a unit of account or a store of value. Fewer than 600 merchants in the United Kingdom accept, accept exchange tokens as a payment tool. The Financial Markets Law Committee has suggested that digital currencies which are pegged to fiat currencies can be regarded as e-money and be negotiable. The FLMC also suggests that the traditional categories of English law could be extended to recognize uh, what they call as virtual shows in possession as a new form of property. In Scotland, where our property law has a strong civilian flame framework, we would need to recognize a new form of intangible movable property. A re-examination of the suitability of the tools of property law and trust law for our modern financial system would be a good idea in any event. There has been a debate for several years now on modernizing or at least clarifying the law to accommodate intermediated securities. Intermediation at its simplest is the chain from the issuer of a security through the register holder such as a central securities depository in the Crest system via one or more intermediaries to the ultimate account holders. The question of the rights of the various parties in the chain and in particular the protection of the interest of the ultimate account holder has engaged the FLMC, the Law Commission, the UK government and in relation to private international law, international bodies for several years. DLT is seen, as some, as, is seen by some as a potential solution to some of the problems created by intermediation. 
a careful examination of this possibility uh, together with an examination of the appropriate legal rules for digital currencies and DLT transactions would be a major undertaking. But if successful, it would serve to provide a legal infrastructure to facilitate fintech. Another matter which needs to be addressed is whether the AI involved in fintech should give rise to intellectual property which the law should recognize. If machines act autonomously to create new contracts, should there be copyright and who should own it? Similar questions arise in relation to patents if such machines invent things which have industrial application. In relation to copyright, the UK, UK law treats uh, as the author of a computer-generated work the person by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of, of the work are undertaken. This approach appears to have considerable potential to create disputes, particularly if a machine is involved in the arrangements. I turn then to separate legal personality. One option for addressing the various questions arising out of the use of AI in fintech is to explore whether to give uh, a computer or algorithm separate legal personality. At first blush, that might sound far-fetched, but there is no reason in principle why the law cannot accommodate uh, such legal personality. English law has for a long time allowed an office occupied by a natural person to be a corporation's soul. Uh, the separate legal personality of a one-person company has been recognized since 1897. And more recently in Bumper Development Corporation, it is, uh, uh, English law has recognized the separate legal personality which exists in, English, in Indian law for a ruined temple which was little more than a pile of stones. Would it be possible for a machine as a separate legal person to own intellectual property and in turn to be owned by a financial institution? Why not? The institution's uh, license or the general regulatory law could impose on the firm responsibility for any malfunction if, for example, it had been involved in the design of the algorithm. The law could confer separate legal personality on the machine by registration and require it or its owner to have compulsory insurance to cover its liability to third parties in delict or in restitution. And as a registered person, the machine could own the intellectual property which it created. I turn then to ask, how is the law to be adapted? It will be clear from what I've said up to now that it's not practical to develop the common law through case law in order to create a suitable legal regime for fintech. The judiciary simply does not have the institutional competence to do so. The changes in the law which are required are not interstitial lawmaking, uh, which has long been recognized as the task of judges. They will require interdisciplinary policy making and consultation, which a court cannot perform when resolving individual disputes and developing case law as it, as, as it does. The Lord Chief Justice's initiative last week in setting up an advisory body is very welcome as a means of alerting the judiciary and the court system to the opportunities and challenges of AI. But a larger scale collaboration involving the executive branch of government, focusing on AI and fintech and aiming to produce facilitating legislation is probably needed if the UK is to facilitate the development of fintech without harming the integrity of the markets and, and uh, financial consumers. As the Law Society of England and Wales has stated in a related context, and I quote, the statutory approach ensures that there is a framework in place that everyone can understand. Before concluding, I turn uh, to international conventions and model laws. The United Kingdom's financial services industry is global in its reach. If fintech is to achieve its potential and contribute to the economic welfare of this country and other countries, legal reform and regulatory change cannot be confined to the domestic market, but must aspire to promote cross-border financial transactions and to facilitate international trade. 
The current conflicting approaches to the treatment of crypto assets by key jurisdictions such as the USA, the EU and the UK support the, the case for international cooperation in the creation of fintech law. One option would be to develop a model law along the lines of the model laws uh, which the UN Commission uh, on International Trade Law, UNCTRAL, has developed and other states have adopted. Another is the preparation of an international convention. At the very least, there needs to be international cooperation to establish agreed rules of private international law uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to create a governing law in relation to contracts executed and property held in a distributed ledger which operates across borders. I wonder if UNITROI, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, might have a, a role to play here. It seems to me that the involvement of an international intergovernmental body might uh, reduce the suspicion by developing countries that large developed economies were dictating the rules. An alternative would be to build up a multilateral consensus among leading trading nations, but that might be less satisfactory. Finally, regulation and the much promised regulatory sandbox. There is an increasing awareness outside the field of financial services of the risks that AI and big data analysis pose to privacy and to human rights. Just as people can be excluded from flights and train stations, so also can fintech be designed to promote social control and achieve social exclusion. It will all be in the algorithms. The preparation of statements of ethical standards has a role to play. But I doubt whether there's a public appetite for self-regulation in financial services and big tech industries. There needs to be regulation to protect investors and consumers, to promote market integrity and to preserve financial stability. At the same time, a regulatory regime must not stifle innovation. The Financial Conduct Authority's invention in 2015 of the regulatory sandbox is, to my mind, a very important innovation. The regulatory sandbox is a framework set up by a financial services regulator to allow small-scale live testing of innovations by private firms operating under a special exemption or limited uh, temporary exception under the supervision of the regulator. The sandbox allows the private firm to test products and services on a small scale with appropriate financial backing to indemnify consumers against loss and enables the regulator to assist in identifying safeguards to protect consumers which should be built into the, such products and services. This collaboration should enable them to be brought to the market speedily. Another possible use for the, for the regulatory sandbox would be to analyse transactions to test the efficacy of proposed legal rules which could form a statutory framework of the applicable rules on contract law, delict or tort and property. The regulatory sandbox has proved to be popular internationally and in August 2018 the FCA and 11 other regulators announced the creation of a global, innovation sand, a net, a global financial innovation network. This is intended to create a so-called global sandbox which would enable firms to trial new products in several countries at the same time and allow regulators to exchange ideas on policy. The international harmonization of regulatory standards would serve to discourage financial institutions from seeking out jurisdictions with the least effective regulation as a base for their fintech business. Discouraging such regulatory arbitrage ought over time to enhance market protection and consumer market integrity and consumer protection. So in conclusion Financial services play a very important role in the economy of the United Kingdom, including the economy of Edinburgh. Our country has a great interest in establishing a leading position in the development of fintech. An important precondition of establishing and maintaining the UK as a centre of excellence in the development and operation of fintech is the development of our laws and regulatory systems to facilitate the use of such technology. This is, as I've, hoped, I've shown, 
a big undertaking. It requires a collaboration between financiers, consumer, uh, computer specialists, judges, lawyers, law reform bodies, the executive, and the legislature. Data is power, and AI is power. Can the law cope? My answer is yes, but it will require legislation. There also needs to be innovative regulation. Further, there is a need for international agreement on legal and regulatory norms if fintech is to achieve its potential in wealth creation and poverty reduction through cross-border transactions while maintaining market integrity and protecting the consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you.